Thank you for joining us. Today we've got uh, a Monty Mumford, um, a tech journalist, uh, a world nomad and all round badass. How are you doing, Monty? I'm all right, man. How are you? How's... You're in Malta, are you? Uh, I am. I am boiling, uh, to say the least. But uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll always kind of find something to complain about. How was it in the UK? Uh, well, it was very hot here about two weeks ago. Uh, the highest ever temperature was 40.3 degrees. I'm sure you get that every day. Um, but it meant, meant I had to shave my head to, to uh, get rid of my beard. It was too hot. So I thought <laughs> I'd go for a new look, try and look like you, uh, John Michel. Well, you're doing a fantastic job, I can tell you. Um, uh, ever since I've known you, you've had the, you've had a full head of hair, and it's nice, it's it's great to see us um, chatting on even on, on an even playing field for once. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Monty, I've known you for um, for a, a little while. Obviously, we've been um, my business partners. But for everyone who who, who um, doesn't, um, give us a little intro on who you are and what exactly it is you do in the space. <laughs> Everyone always asks me that, and I never know quite how to answer. Um, I didn't really do much for 20 years. Uh, I travelled the world, kissed the girls, kissed the, kissed the girls, uh, did some crazy things, retrained as a journalist uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, and from that point, it's all been a bit of a, you know, it's all been a bit of a, a crazy time, actually. I, um, I worked for an IT magazine for a, for a year, as a trainee sub-editor, because I knew nothing about technology. Um, and then I became a website editor. Then I was the communications director on the first series of Big Brother here in the UK, which was a massive deal uh, and led to a huge you know, box of co contacts uh, that I've used over the years. Uh, I moved into games. Mobile games uh, was one of the pioneers in mobile games. There's a few stories there that are too long to go into. Um, and then moved to India in 2008 for a couple of years with my ex-wife and son. Uh, lived on the beach, um, started to work from home maybe uh, 12 or 13 years before anybody else did. Uh, working in internet cafes and stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, which, was, which was amazing. Came back in 2010. Uh, I'd been writing for the Telegraph when I was away uh, about India. Uh, and then they agreed uh, for me to turn that into a technology column, uh, which I did. Uh, and I started writing for all of the major, well, everyone really, from TechCrunch to Mashable to MIT Tech Review, Newsweek, had a column for the Telegraph, column for Forbes. Um, but I think the one, the one thing that changes it all for me was uh, I think it was in 2011, I wrote a piece about, it sounds a bit weird now, but uh, which European startup is going to be the next $100 million euro exit? You know, we, in those days, we thought 100 million euros was a huge amount of money. Um, but I chose uh, Viadio, which was a French LinkedIn that was very successful. Mind Candy, uh, which owned Moshi Monsters, which is okay. Uh, SoundCloud, obviously a very good one. Uh, Brandwatch, that sold for 545 million last year, and Spotify. So I picked quite well. Um, and just a couple of VCs said, dude, you know, you know, we wish that we could pick five like those. So I decided to, well, I wasn't compl completely confident about it because I'd just come back from India. And my feet were still in the beach, on the beach, you know. It was, it was still took time to get back into it. Um, but then I started picking companies to work with, or, or they picked me. Uh, and I, I would say over the last, yeah, it's probably 10 years now, I've worked with 35 companies, 35 to 40 companies. Uh, and there's been a combined exit and money raise of about $1.6 billion. Uh, which sounds really impressive. I mean, two of those companies were for 900. So you could say that I've worked with uh, 35 companies for 1.6 billion or take away the successes. And you could say that I've worked with 33 for, uh, for 900 million. You, you know what I mean? Or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's just it, that's the thing that, like, I, that's what I like is catching, catching a wave, catching a fire. Uh, and making these companies famous by 
you know, introducing them to investors or my network or journalists or get them the coverage for them, putting them on panels at, 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 at the, you know, at trade conferences, which is back, fortunately. Um, and I just love what I do, uh, jean I love what I do. That's that's uh, that's um, great to hear. I always think eventually when you if people are lucky enough to find what they what they enjoy doing, um, life gets a whole lot easier. Although uh, although I think it's something very very few of us find. Um, although um, I do want to touch on a different point, Monty. Um, so you, you've 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 clearly been in uh, in a sort of traditional tech space for for a long time, albeit from from a sort of number of different perspectives. Uh, and you've made your sort of fair share of, um, you know, sort of decent f future calls, right? And what's going to be successful. So um, how long have you been in the, in the blockchain space for? And which companies do you think are sort of m most likely to have a similar future as the, as the previous companies you mentioned? It's a good question. Um, I, was, I was, bear in mind, I thought I was quite early to most things. I was a bit late to crypto. So it's probably about five years ago. Uh, when I started to look into it, and I was more interested in the blockchain aspect of it all than uh, the crypto side of it all. Um, but I did, I, you know, I did have some money in Ether, but uh, I, then I lost complete faith of it um, when I had 163 Ether stolen from my Ether wallet. Uh, I'm still trying to get it back. I think Binance are to blame. Uh, I got bounty hunters involved. I've tried everything to get that back because it's now. It was 25k at the time. Now it's uh, well, it's a pretty decent house. You know what I mean. So, uh, so that's really irritating. Uh, but I did come back, come back about a couple of years ago. I think well, the two of us we set up a, uh, a podcast called Block Speak, didn't we? And we interviewed the major figures and all the all the words we heard from those experts were. Hey, I thought, well, they're not all charlatans. Some of these people are really intelligent. People like Charles Hoskinson and you know, others that we interviewed on that show, uh, and obviously the great late departed John McAfee, who I consider a personal friend. Um, I still think he was an authentic man, uh, whatever, pe whatever other people say about it. John um, was great. So, yeah, he was an amazing guy. Uh, so, I, so I came back in with a small amount of you know investment, you know, and I cashed out when the Russians invaded Ukraine uh, earlier this year. And I did, you know, I, I did very, very well out of that, you know what I mean? But probably more personally, um, at the beginning of last year, uh, some friend of mine uh, wanted me to be a co-founder of a DeFi privacy uh, project called Siena Network. Uh, Siena was, was one of the Italian cities where uh, there was trade, trade between Venice and Rome. One, one of the early examples of crypt cryptography uh, where the Knights Templar would you know, start banking, you know, across Italy, there was a lot of robbery, you know, pop piracy on the road between Vienna, uh, sorry, Vienna, Siena uh, and Venice. So, you know, you could give your, give, you'd basically give a number to the Knights Templar, you would get to the other end and you could pick up your money without being robbed. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the etymology of the company. But um, so so we wanted to raise 500k uh, early last year. It was a bit of a frenzy. We raised 6.6 .6 million, I think, in a public or private sale. And it just showed that you know there's a need that there's there's a difference a difference between privacy and anonymity. Um, anonymity is bad. Privacy is good. Jean Michel, if I owed you a thousand dollars and I paid you in crypto. You could see every transaction I'd ever made in crypto, and I could see every transaction that you'd ever made. This is patently wrong. Um, that needs to be protected. It means that people can front run your trades, all types of things. Um, so I suppose that got me really excited. You know, we, we've suffered a little bit because of the crypto winter, but we're still producing, creating products, um, and are confident that we can ride this wave of, you know, downward season or crypto winter, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think, you know, an answer to your question, apart from, you know, pushing my company, is that, you know, the company, the, this is a great time to innovate. This is a great time to be, to, to, to be serious about crypto. Bear markets are where, you know, I'm trying to think of a 
an animal, you know, like this is where the giraffes are formed. You know, the ones <laughs> that continue to believe and want to be part of this. The ones that run away in the stampede are definitely the buffaloes. You know what I mean? But we are the ones, or let's just say the elephants. You know, the elephants in the room are the ones who decide to stay when everyone else is running away. Uh, and I think we've seen, you know, recent moves, especially with Ethereum. Uh, and I think with some huge uh, interest rate rises, especially the Fed, we've got midterm elections in November. The Fed has sucked the liquidity out of a lot of markets. I think there's probably going to be a big interest rate uh, in the UK in the next week or so. Uh, but you saw last week, you know, interest rates went up. Crypto soared, you know what I mean? There, there is a, a feeling that what we are in a world where scarcity is even more important than ever when it comes to value. The scarcity of food, if you're unlucky enough to be waiting on a shipment from Ukraine, the scarcity of land if you're trying to buy a house, the scarcity of money, especially when it comes to crypto, you know, there is a scarcity element there. If you wanted to look at it in a really bizarre way, but not an impractical way, everyone talks about crypto going to zero. But if you keep printing dollars and you keep printing euros and rubles and yuans, you know, is, is, is fiat going to zero? Is that more likely that fiat currencies are on their way to zero rather than crypto? That's my belief that perhaps they are. Yeah, this is a, this is an interesting discussion um, uh, that I think sort of um, divides a lot of people in and outside of the blockchain industry, right? Like especially especially when you think uh, when you begin to consider that, that most people outside the industry still think that dollar bills are backed by gold bullion. But uh, anyway, that's a, that's a sort of story for a different time. Um, go back to something which you which you um, brought up in your previous statement, which was the the difference between anonymity and privacy um, and uh, um, you mentioned one's, one's good and one's bad. Can you peel off a couple of layers of that um, um, argument? Well, well, I think if you're doing anything non anonymously, and I think crypto suffers from this, especially when it comes to the non-crypto world, you know, that there's, there's untold amounts of, you know, I think Solana may have been hacked today, you know, and there's been thefts from exchanges. There seems to be you know, an impression that the balls run, the, you know, there's crypto whales run the market, they can dip in, they dip in when, when they want to. Uh, and, you know, the whole trope that crypto is all about drug dealers and arm dealers and terrorist organisations, this is all based on the, the notion of anonymity, that they can do these things without, um, and get away with it. You know, this is changing big time. You know, I don't think anyone knew what KYC was five years ago. You know, everyone now knows what know your custom, customer is. Anyone that has, you know, any form of investment on Coinbase, you know, I wouldn't mention Binance. I don't think my experience of Binance was bad. Um, it's a pretty serious and a, and a rigorous process uh, to, to be recognised, you know what I mean? So, so I think the, the anonymous thing, the dark web, the dark crypto, it's just an old thing. It's just stupid and ridiculous. And it's an easy thing for traditional money men to throw at, throw at you. You know, oh, you're dodgy, you know, like anyone can do it. You're all drug dealers, you're all this, that, and the other. It's a load of crap, you know. Um, and that is obviously bad, anonymity. But I think it is being sorted. I think people, you know, KYC has been a big part of it, uh, you know, and other forms of identity, um, you know, and digital makes it easier to, 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 to regulate these type of people. And I really believe that that's changed a lot since I've been in it five years' time. As I said, privacy is like any other thing. You know, if I'm sitting in crypto, you don't want to see my crypto transactions. It's the same as if, if, if I sent you £100 or £1,000 to, to, your, to your bank account, I could see what you're doing. I mean, this type of stuff is... It's dangerous for people to know, you know what I mean? You spend your money on this, you spend your money on that. It's privacy is important. It's a fundamental human right uh, to have, you know, that's well, hopefully we can maintain those uh, private aspects of our lives. But, you know, that's the, that's, that's the difference, I think. Fair, no, I, and I mean, I think it's... Uh... 
I think it sort of um, alludes to the fact that um, to the sort of evolving nature of the industry, right? So, like, like you very, like you very um, rightly said, in the in the sort of heydays of um, a BTC, right? Everything really was about you know drugs and and, and buying like like illegal stuff on uh, online, right? And that was what the what the Silk Road was about at the end of the day. Um, uh, and and we we've we've sort of um, evolved a little um, uh, from that, and I think the 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 notion of um, blockchain providing um, immutable but traceable um, anonymity sort of pushed people to to look at um, both privacy and anonym- and anonymity as as a completely um, binary idea when. In my opinion, in reality, there's there's sort of varying degrees of each, and 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 they can they can both be important in in, um, uh, in specific situations. I think though, what's what's um, what's even more disturbing is um, is people seem to have uh, lost their their respect um, for privacy and both their own digital privacy as well as the digital privacy of others. What do you what do you think about that? Well, I don't think so much. The, 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 no. the, the, of losing respect, I've just simply lost our data. You know, me, you know, John, show we both know people that are black hats or white hats or grey hats, and, uh, and and we've had conversations with them, and they'll tell you everyone will tell you the same thing. We lost we lost all of our privacy uh, when it comes to data ten years ago. You know what I mean? It's too late for that. Uh, everybody knows, you know, just about anything that they can find out about it. So there's so many. So about five million cameras in my country, in the in the UK. It's, if I walk down the road, there's probably one on me now in this building. You know what I mean? I think it's the worst thing. I think Big Brother, you know, came here a long time ago and ate up all the other people in the family. You know, the big, the big, the big mama, the big dad, the big son. You know what I mean? But I think that's why it's so important for fresh data, new data, to be protected. Everybody saw a way in. Every hacker could see a way in five, ten years ago about how to do this, how to do that. And they did it. They were successful at doing it. You can see what's going on in this war that we have in Europe. You know, it's all about data. It's all about cyber warfare. It's all about, you know, we know that you know that we know that you know. Um, but I would just say that now is the time. You know, data is created as we speak. As, as I'm speaking now, we need to protect fresh data. You know, because old data is history. You know, it might be that you knew exactly what I was doing, you know, two years ago, but, you know, you you don't quite know what I'm going to be doing in two years' time. And I think it's very important that the tools that do exist um, to give us future privacy are extraordinarily important. Yeah, I I tend to agree with you there. Um, My... um, I used to be of the opinion that compliance would be a potential solution to this issue. Um, and the more I think about it, the more I think it's, the more I think it's a bad idea. So um, as an example, um, banks here locally are now forced by, uh, by the Financial Services Authority to issue um, credit cards made out of re- recycled plastic. And that's something which, which, is, which the bank would never do on its own, like on its own um, initiative, right? Um, and that's a relatively simple thing to regulate. In the case of the internet, however, um, and, and maybe this is just a sort of naive belief, but I, I tend to think that, um, that regulators more often than not end up overreaching in areas which they don't fully understand. And I also think that the benefits of Web3 will be enough to solve this privacy issue purely for the for the reasons which you which you mentioned. Maybe it's an optimistic sort of uh, view on things. What's your take? Well, listen, if there's any new technology, you've got to be optimistic, right? You know what I mean? If you, if you think that new technology is going to be bad, then, you know, what's the point? So we've got to believe, you know, but there again, the ideals of the internet 20, 25 years ago have turned into an infected reality. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't think the metaverse is really going to be anything else other than an adverse. You know, I, mean, I don't mean adverse, but I mean ad, 
verse. It's just going to be another place where you're going to be bombarded with images, um, you know, with brands, etc., etc., etc. I mean, I, I, am, I am intrigued by Web3 um, in a certain amount of way, but, but I would kind of go back to what we've got now, which is maybe one of the problems. Uh, and this is often fated on blockchain. You know, blockchain is immutable. You've got proof and smart contracts. You did this, we did that. And you owe me 100 grand or you owe me 10 coins or you owe me this, right? Um, that's all very well. But who is going to be the person that rules on that? If you say, oh, okay, yes, yeah, in the blockchain, apparently I owe you 100 grand, come and get it. You know what I mean? If you want it, come and get it. I'm not paying, don't want to pay. That's what's important. You know, that's, well, that's where regulation uh, comes in, is that it's all right, it's all great we're having a blockchain, you know, on a number of blockchains or IBC or whatever you want to call it. But you still got to make that feel as if this is, this is, is a proper environment, right, for those type of things to happen. You know, it's you know you need you need a regular. You regu who's going to regulate on that? Who's the judge? We say this guy owes me. It's not, it's on the blockchain. You owe me a hundred grand. I don't, and he doesn't want to pay. How are you actually going to do that? You know, there are probably ways of doing it. I would imagine with technology or or digital or data. So, so uh, the, the one thing I think about kind of movement forwards of technology is that sometimes we jump onto the next thing when we haven't sorted out the thing that's going on at the moment. You know, the internet's infected, right, by bad actors, by bad players, by bad data, by hackers. You know, I don't trust, I, 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 I would never have a mobile financial app on my phone for a start, you know, any form of, you know, financial transaction I do, be, be it old school or new school, is, is completely, touch wood secure you know so thinking that web3 is a, is a panacea for privacy and everything like that you might be right you probably won't be uh, there'll probably be a jumps that go off in different ways and there'll be an amazing solution that we never thought of and there'll be amazing rubbish from what we thought was amazing I and mean, that's part of the interest in it right you know what i mean that's that, that's what that's what we that, that, that's what makes it intriguing and fascinating Absolutely. Well, uh, Monty, thank you. Thank you so much for your insight. I think uh, your, your um, perspective is really um, unique and something which I think our audience on the show very much appreciate. Uh, so uh, thank you for taking the time and uh, looking forward to having you back on the studio in a couple of months. Hey, man. Uh, a couple of months, I thought I'd be a regular guest. <laughs> uh, <this is> <laughs> show. It's great. It's always a privilege to talk about. It's a privilege to be on the show. Thanks for inviting me. I was going to wear my new Sienna Network merch uh, T-shirt, but I wore it to a wedding on Saturday. So I've got Levi's. But uh, <laughs> just look out, uh, look out for Sienna Network. Uh, there's some interesting stuff coming up for us. And uh, that's two ends, Sienna Network. So I'm plugging myself at the end, John Show. Sorry about that. As is your right, Monty. Take it easy. Have a good one. Peace Cheers. Best of water.